Okay, we are back, my friends. All oh, prophecy fulfilled. We are in Acts chapter 10. We are looking at Cornelius. This is part two. Um, probably going to be a part three. I know it's kind of overkill, isn't it? Uh, we're looking at Cornelius, the curious case of not Benjamin Button, the curious case of Cornelius the Centurion. Now, last lesson was kind of a setup for this lesson, because what I did is I provided some historical context um, in terms of Israelites. And when I say Israelites, I mean both Jews and uh, those of the house of Israel, both really uh, how they had served in foreign, foreign militaries throughout their history as they did in the days of the Roman Empire. And I think that's the case with Cornelius. Now, as I, I also mentioned to you, the, the big picture context, the, the backstory that brought us up to the New Testament, that brought us up to Acts chapter 10, where we're at now. And that's the backstory is Israel's covenant story under law. That's the big picture context. That's the backstory. And I, and I wonder if sometimes we just kind of forget about that as we're reading a, a specific passage or a, a specific text like this, we tend to get tunnel vision disregarding all that's come before it. So um, the context is exactly that. That one kingdom and nation had become two separate nations. A distinction with all Israel developed. You have the Jews. You have the house of Judah. Uh, regarding their scattered uh, house of Israelite brethren as another nation. They were another nation. And as they were, you know, kind of dispersed within the Goyim or among the Goyim, that's exactly how they were regarded. As Goyim as Gentile, as the nations. But redemption would come with a gathering uh, uh, of all Israel's elect in their last days as that first covenant world passed away. And redemption, you know what that meant? That meant reunification of these two kingdoms, of these two nations, of these two houses. The dividing wall would come down. The enmity uh, between these two houses, these nations, would be done away with because the law would be done away with. Uh, it, would, it would leave neither Jew nor Gentile. There's your distinction within all Israel. Uh, but it would, there would be one new man in Christ. Christ gathered all Israel, the elect, together into a new covenant body. Okay, Acts chapter 10. What did Peter see? Uh, he had a vision. Acts chapter 10, let's, we're going to be in 11 through 14. Are you ready? Let's rock and roll. What did he see? He saw heaven opened and an object or a vessel like a great sheep bound at the four corners descending on him and lit down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals on the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Okay. I am constantly screaming, you know, Look for the contextual clues. Right. Uh, that come out in the in the form of words and phrases that's that really should serve as is signs that point us directly back to the prophet's message. Things that should look familiar, things that should bring other things to remembrance to us, things that should give us a big hello McFly. Right. Cluing us in on the fact that those things which the prophet's spoken of are coming to fruition right here. And we've got four massive, in-your-face, hello McFlies right here in these four verses. 
You've got vessels, you've got four corners, you've got these animals, and you've got this idea of defilement or uncleanness. We're going to look at each one of those today. Are you ready? Let's do it. Contextual clue number one is vessel. Or as Star Trek's Lieutenant Chekhov would say, Wessel. <laughs> Some of you may get that. Um, number one, vessel. Now, this little clue is sometimes veiled from us because we don't see it in most of our translations. It's either omitted or it's rendered something kind of vague like it is here, uh, an object, right? So uh, in the Berean literal Bible, it reads like this, uh, Acts 10, 11. He beholds heaven opening and a certain vessel as, great, as a great sheet descending, being let down upon the earth by four corners. So you've got vessel, the word is skyus. It's a vessel. It's an implement. It's an instrument. It's something that can be used or it should be useful. Um, as in Acts chapter 9 verse 15, Paul was referred to as a chosen vessel of God. You got the, that's the same word. We also see vessels of mercy or vessels of wrath in uh, Romans chapter 9. So how does this relate to anything? How is this a clue, right? Or better yet, how does this relate to anything that the prophet said? And how does that relate to this interaction between Cornelius and Peter? Okay, well, simple. It all goes back to Israel's story and her trajectory, right? Um, that would eventually bring her... Israel promised redemption. Remember Hosea? I just can't get enough of Hosea, can I? Okay, what would happen to Israel? Hosea 8, verse 8. Israel is swallowed up. Now they were, are among the Gentiles, the nations, like a vessel, Kali. Which in which is no pleasure. The word is kali. It's basically the equivalent to the one that you read in Acts chapter uh, 10. Now, I, I hope you see how this, uh, this really should be like a big contextual alarm going off in our minds here. This is a Helomic fly. Israel would be swallowed up into the goyim, mixed, mingled, part in among the, the Gentile nations like a worthless vessel. They were dead to God. They were strangers to God. Uh, they were defiled. They were unclean. They were a worthless vessel. And here Peter, he, you know, he, he looks up in the heavens and a certain vessel like a sheet is descending. This is clue number one, that this vessel is connected to Israel. In fact, it is Israel. It's this vessel are the Israelites who've been swallowed up, uh, but the, you know, into the nations, but God was pulling them back. He was pulling in the elect like Cornelius, like a tractor beam. I mean, doesn't this just align perfectly with the idea of a gathering, right? Which was only promised to Israel. I believe it does. They were made a worthless vessel, but here comes that vessel out of the sky. Coming back, coming back to Peter. Back to join their Jewish brothers through a new covenant. That's a pretty good clue. Clue number two immediately follows in the very same sentence. And I want you to notice uh, where this vessel was uh, coming down from. The four corners. Now that sounds familiar. And you ought to know this by now, because I've mentioned it about a million times. Uh, this is an Old Testament prophetic last days theme, right? A theme that grows out of Moses and Deuteronomy. It's developed by the long line of prophets. Israel would be scattered to the four corners of the land, to the ends of the land, to the ends of the earth, right? To the farthermost point. This is the exact idea that the prophets conveyed when they mentioned, you know, that Israel would be scattered to the north, south, east, west, right? And a good handful of verses uh, that use that wording, uh, it's the same idea as being made far off or, you know, made afar. It's the same 
concept. It's just another common phrase used by the prophets, the four corners. And all of these phrases, all of them are conveying basically the same idea. This is where Israel would go. Uh, this is from where they would come back. They would be gathered back. That was the promise. Scattered, gathered, ends of the earth, afar, north, south, east, west, and the four corners. Isaiah eleven twelve, And will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the, dis the dispersed of Judah. Where? From the four corners of the earth. So it's not that difficult to piece this together. If Israel would be swallowed up and made like a worthless, unclean vessel in the nations, and Israel would be gathered from the four corners, um, and then Peter sees these unclean animals coming down to him like a tractor beam on the four corners, you know, a four-cornered vessel, if you will. <laughs> well, I mean, then come on! I mean, come on, what does this make Cornelius if the vision was clearly about Cornelius and other unclean Gentiles like him? It makes him an Israelite, a descendant of Israel. In fact, Paul and uh, Barnabas told the law-practicing Jews that they, the Jews, were neglecting their mission to be a light to their Israelite brethren who were scattered to the four corners, the ends of the earth. And they, and they drew from Isaiah chapter 49. Now listen to this. Acts 13, 46, 47. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, It was necessary to speak the word of God to you first, but since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, the ethnos, Right? The nations. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. He started, then he draws from uh, Isaiah 49. I have made you a light for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, did you notice the phrase, the ends of the earth? That's the north, south, east, west. That's from afar. That's the four corners. Folks, one more time. In case you didn't hear me the first 300 times. Only Israel was promised a gathering from the four corners. Redemption back to Yahweh through a new covenant. Redemption, uh, you know, back into one nation. Salvation from the curse and death of the law, Israel. And here Paul is telling the Jews that he's turning to the Gentiles so that salvation to Israel, as described by Israel's prophets, would be fulfilled and would be accomplished. Think about that. He's drawing from Isaiah 49, 6, where so many people uh, claim is dealing with three different groups of people. Well, it's dealing with the house of Israel, it's dealing with the house of Judah, and it's dealing with all Gentiles of all humanity, like you and me today. No, it's not. Not even close. The salvation of Isaiah 49, 6, it only pertains really to one group of people. Israel. Check it out. I'll even read it for you here, then I'll explain it. Isaiah 49, 6. Indeed, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel, and I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. See, that's what Paul and Barnabas were talking about. That you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, Man, this is where so many people just, they, they lose their minds and they, they check out, you know, as far as their ability to, to think objectively and in light of the context. In fact, if you go back to uh, Isaiah 48, you're going to really, the, the context builds there. And it's talking about Israel and how uh, there would be a fulfillment of this gathering because uh, you you got to consider their history uh, as in, in it mentions uh, Babylon. And there was there were restorations in their history where they were gathered back after Babylon into their land from the ends of the earth. This was fulfilled. This was accomplished. And yet Paul is actually using this verse and that fulfillment to des uh, describe what's going on in his day. Um, now, you can call that whatever the heck you want. You can call that uh, typological fulfillment. You can call that double fulfillment. I don't really care what you call it. All I know is that it 
pertains to Israel and their gathering. I think it pertains to their gathering after Babylon. And I think it pertains to the gathering that Paul's talking about right here, right now. So, but no, it's not three separate groups, including all uh, humanity, all Gentiles, right? And th like I said, this is where so many people just kind of turn off their brains and say, right there, you got three groups of people, Ryan, house of Israel, house of Judah, and Gentiles. That settles it. That's humanity. Game over. And meanwhile, I'm just kind of sitting there kind of, oh, you know, oh, yawning as they dance a jig because they think they, they have one verse there in the Old Testament, you know, that proves their paradigm. Well, no, not if you read it in light of their story steeped within the context of their split, their scattering, you know, into the nations and their gathering and their reunification into their land. Now, let me break this down for you. Let me tell you who these, these, these three groups are referring to in uh, Isaiah 49, 6. Number one, when he says, I'm going to raise up the tribes of Jacob, that's all 12 tribes. That's the whole house of Israel. That's the big picture. There's a, a raising up. You know what that is? That's resurrection. That's Israel's resurrection, folks. Israel's resurrection from the death of the old covenant body into a new covenant body. That's like Ezekiel 37. You got the dry bones. All Israel, the entirety, all 12 tribes would be raised as one. Uh, what was that, Hosea 6? On the you know third day, I'll, I'll raise them up. Uh, number two, you have the preserved ones of Israel. Now that's the house of Judah. They were kept. They were preserved. In fact, you go back to uh, one, you go back one chapter into Isaiah 48, and it talks about how the Jews are kept through covenant. It's about Israel. Uh, although they, you know, the house of, of Judah, although they were under the curse, and yes, they suffered, they, they remained, and they, they labored under the law, God preserved the house of Judah. That's who that's talking about. And number three, the Gentiles, um, that is, those are the cutoff, scattered of Israel into the Goyim, the nations to which they'd gone and to which they had become. This was the mission of salvation to the ends of the earth. That was the mission as they were gathered back out of Babylon, and this is the mission in Paul's day. Okay, uh, from the four corners, from the north, south, east, west, to gather the lost sheep. And again, in the last day, I would say that would be mainly from the house of Israel. But yes, they were certainly dispersed of Judah as well. Okay, I beat that into the ground. Uh, contextual clue number three. You've got these animals. You've got these wild beasts. You've got these creeping things. Well, by golly, there they are again. They just keep rearing their heads don't they? Um, the same animals we saw in Hosea uh, and really through all the, the prophets like Hosea chapter 2, right? Um, so look, I really don't think I need to cover this in depth. Uh, go back to lesson, uh, or the last two lessons, I guess, or last three lessons, and I think I've clearly, adequately demonstrated how Israel changed their glory. Hosea 4, Romans chapter 1 and 2. They essentially changed their covenantal status. They exchanged their glory and knowledge of God, right? They took on the, really, the image of the beastly, unclean nations that they assimilated into. Now, most people tend to uh, generically say that these Animals represent all people, all humanity, or all Gentiles outside of Israel. And it seems to me the only unclean animals who'd be invited into the new covenant were those who were made unclean through forsaking law, for, through their idolatry, and being cast out into the unclean nations. These animals are not Gentiles everywhere. They are Gentile Israelites made unclean. We have to tether Gentiles to the storyline, to Israel's storyline. We have to tie and identify, I think, scattered Israelites with the very same unclean, beastly animals they'd assimilated and attached themselves to. Enough said on that. Contextual clue number four 
is the idea of being unclean. Peter makes the objection that these Gentiles, represented metaphorically, right, as animals, are unclean. And that's important. So these people needed cleansing. For example, just as the idea of being dead in trespasses, right? That's, that's only associated with the law. People don't seem to get that. Being dead is a result of being under the law. Um, so too with being cleansed. That is directly tied to covenant in law. We need to ask ourselves, uh, what would these animals need cleansing from? And why would God cleanse them? Well, if these folks are people, and they are, the answer is that God would cleanse these people because He promised to. That's important. Remember the passage, you probably don't, but remember the passage that I read last lesson, Ezekiel 37, I read verse 19 through 22, about two houses coming back together, the house of Israel, the house of Judah, right? And they were considered two nations coming back together. Now, let me read it again so we're familiar with it. Here it is, Ezekiel 37, 19 through 22. I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel associated with him, and I will put them together with the stick of Judah. I will make them a single stick. They will become one in my hand. When the sticks on which you write are in your hand in full view of the people, you are to tell them, that this is what the Lord God says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations to which they have gone, and I will gather them from all around and bring them into, into the land. I will make them one nation in the land, in the mountains of Israel, and one king will rule over them. Over them. Then they will no longer be two nations and will never again be divided into two kingdoms. Okay, it's all about Israel. You see that, right? Coming back together. And again, hey, Place that fulfillment, you know, the restoration period, the second temple period, that's fine. Uh, but you've got to consider the fact how Paul, Paul is using these things in the New Testament, but I digress. A divided kingdom that had become two houses, two nations, becoming one. Now, that's where I stopped last lesson. Okay, now get a load of this. On the tail end of this, just after this, verse 23, what's he say? He says, they, meaning Israel, will no longer defile themselves with their idols or detestable image or with any of their transgressions. I will save them from all their apostasies by which they sinned, and I will cleanse them. And they will be my people, and I will be their God. Wow. So, Israel is being cleansed here. Well, from what? From their defilement through idolatry. And we talked about that constantly. Go back again to Hosea uh, chapter 4, Romans 1 and 2, right? Um, and, and he says, and then... They will be my people. Well, golly gee whiz, that sure sounds like Hosea 1, Israel becoming not his people, but then becoming his people. A nation not his people became his people, and that's Israel. Here's another one, just for the heck of it. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 24, 25, For I will take uh, you, Israel, from among the nations, gather you out of the countries, and bring you into your land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. <laughs> idols. It's always about idols with Israel because they were the only people who God promised to make clean and gathered were the only ones who defiled themselves through idolatry against the covenant. Remember Romans chapter 1, verse 24, right? God gave them up to what? To uncleanness. Who was the them? That was Israel. Hosea chapter 6, verse 10. I have seen a horrible thing in this house of Israel. There is holotry of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Israel is unclean. 
It's all over the prophets, my friends. Uh, here's another one here. Let's stay in Ezekiel. What the heck? Ezekiel 20. 23 through 26. Uh, I raised my hand in an oath to those in the wilderness that I would scatter them among the Gentiles, the nations, and disperse them throughout the countries because they had not executed my judgments, but had despised my statutes, profaned my Sabbaths, and their eyes were fixed on their father's idols. Therefore, I gave them up. <laughs> to statutes that were not good, and judgments by which they could not live. And I pronounced them unclean because of their ritual gifts. Please, please, please take, take note on the list of offenses that Israel was guilty of. They're all violations of Yahweh's law in some way or another. Only Israel had Yahweh's law. And only Israel could be made unclean and defiled against Yahweh and His law. And we have to recognize the idea of being cleansed or being purified. It, it, it's covenantal. And it's exclusive to Israel's covenant under law. Those entering the new covenant were being washed clean of sins, of transgression, of violations committed against Yahweh and His law, which was part and parcel with, the, with Yahweh's first covenant that was with Israel. Seems like I just kind of keep going full circle, right? Let's go back again to Ezekiel 37. One more time. I, I want you to look at this. Uh, keep in mind who's in view here. Consider their condition. Consider how they got that way. Right? Under what covenant did they get this way? But at the same time, I want you to turn your, your head a little bit and go to your memory banks and look forward to the new covenant here, the New Testament. And I want you to think about that and think about how their condition would change and why. Some of the verses that we're going to look at in the New Testament. Right? Also, have Hosea in your mind. Just listen again. Listen. Hosea, or Ezekiel thirty-seven twenty-three. They, Israel will no longer defile themselves with their idols or detestable image or with any of their transgressions. I will save them from all their apostasies by which they have sinned. And I will cleanse them and they will be my people and I will be their God. So you see those capitalized words there? Those are your clues contextual clues. And there's a lot of New Testament verses that deal with sin and transgressions and salvation and cleansing. And we have, we've, we've got to stop interjecting ourselves immediately, automatically into the text uh, when we open up our New Testament. And we have to apply these things, you know, uh, to who the New Testament writers were applying them to, to Israel. <laughs> because it was their story right on up to the New Covenant, and it still was thereafter. That's what the New Covenant was for. Those who were defiled under the first, right? So the, the, the first covenant creation, Israel, they were defiled and in need, need of cleansing from their idolatry and sins under that first covenant. So who do you think Paul's referring to? What do you think Paul's drawing from when he says something like this in Ephesians 5.5? 5, 5? For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Well, how did they know that? Well, I'll tell you how they knew. Because they were Gentile Israelites. How many references are there in the New Testament uh, to the church, those entering, you know, uh, Christ being made pure, being made clean, being holy, being washed, you know, prepared uh, as a bride for her husband? Well, there's lots of them. Here's a couple. Ephesians 5, 26, 27. To sanctify her, the church, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her, the church, to himself as a glorious church, without stain or wrinkle or any such blemish 
but holy and blameless. How about Colossians 1.22? But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy, unblemished, and blameless in his presence. Folks, reconciliation, that is a reunion. That's what reconciliation, it's, it's being back together, uh, bringing back together what was once united through covenant, but it had been severed through sin, through idolatry, through transgression of that very covenant. Only Israel needed that reconciliation, that redemption back to God through a new covenant. Uh, what else I got for you here? Uh, question for you. How are sins, or how were sins, taken away? Well, metaphorically speaking, they were washed away, right? Purification through cleansing. Behold, the Lamb of God, who does what? Who takes away the sin of the world. Well, what world? What sin? Well, you know what? <laughs> um, I have got a lot more to say about this, actually about maybe half an hour. So I'm going to cut it off right here uh, because this is actually, um, this is a good breaking point uh, with this idea of cleansing. So we, we've kind of moved our way, I think, uh, into the topic of, you know, cleansing sins, transgressions, and that brings us to the gospel uh, for the remission of sins, for the cleansing, the removal of sins, right? Uh, and we're going to see that uh, here in Acts chapter 10 toward, as we get towards the latter part of the chapter. So I want to adequately deal Deal with that and uh, because that is in view and um, uh, here in, in chapter 10 so we're gonna I'm gonna do that uh, next lesson so we've covered enough here today we covered four contextual clues <laughs> within as many verses uh, vessels four corners animals unclean right there uh, and that was only Acts chapter 10 verses 11 through 14 so next lesson I know <laughs> part three is it's a bit much isn't it part three on Cornelius but whatever next lesson we're gonna finish this up um, yeah, here in Acts chapter 10 and then we'll be moving on and I think maybe I've only got like three or four uh, more of these in this series uh, I think I've adequately demonstrated the case don't you don't answer that uh, okay thanks for tuning in uh, I'm glad you have uh, all two of you um, <laughs> we'll see you next lesson take care everybody adios in to see what condition my condition was in. I said I just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in. Yeah, yeah, Lord, yeah. <laughs>